we're going to go ahead and get started. We have some faculty who are uh, watching at our center, so we're very happy to have them uh, taking time out of their day at the centers and you as well. I know a few more people are coming in after classes, uh, but we want to try to keep things uh, on schedule. Uh, as you saw from the email, this is our first in what I hope is going to be a very uh, long-term series on sabbatical uh, reporting on sabbatical pro uh, projects. This is really an important part of every faculty member's professional life, having that time to go out, re-energize, do the work that you're passionate about, uh, and continue doing work with that. But one of the, the pieces that I think is equally important is to give faculty a forum to share that research with everyone else and to give you some inspiration and tips and guidance on uh, what you two can do as you're thinking about your own sabbatical. So that's, that's what's behind all of this. Uh, we have two presenters today. Um, I'm very grateful to both of them for, uh, for uh, agreeing and stepping forward and doing this uh, to kick off this series. Uh, the plan is to have one in the fall, one in the spring starting next uh, year, but this is kind of our sneak peek uh, into this new series. So again, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to now introduce you to Dr. Candace Roberts, who is our first presenter. Uh, Candace's work was on engaging the brain in higher education. So Candace, I'll leave it to you. Thank, thank you, Mary. Again. Thanks. I understand I have to use the mic for um, the recording and center folks, so, um, so I'll do that. Um, so I had the time of my life on my sabbatical, and I am a huge proponent of taking your sabbatical as soon as you have the opportunity. Um, and I really didn't realize how important it is until I did. Um, so one of the things that I was really interested in was brain-based learning. I'm, I'm in the College of Education and Social Services, and um, so I deal a lot with educational theory, with teaching, preparing people to be the best teachers they can be. Uh, now I'm the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence here at St. Leo. And something I really wanted to know more about, and I tangentially came into um, brain-based learning through different work that I was doing in education, but I really didn't feel like I had a very good handle on it. And so um, I had uh, planned to spend my sabbatical really digging deep into that. So um, my goals for my sabbatical were to pursue professional development in the areas of cognitive science and brain-based learning with a, spe a specific focus on how those intersect with instructional technology and digital tools. Um, I proposed uh, for my sabbatical to read texts that I had come across that I felt like were sort of the seminal texts in brain-based learning cognitive science. Um, and then a number of articles. But one text led to another, led to another, and I actually ended up reading cover to cover um, 22 texts um, and uh, well over 40 articles. Um, I, during my sabbatical, I submitted uh, proposals for two conferences and they were accepted. Uh, but then after uh, my sabbatical, I submitted a couple of other proposals um, on different areas from the first two, and those were also accepted. Um, I attended, let me back up, I attended two conferences that were really focused in the areas that I was interested in exploring. And I, you know, I'm one of those people that when I go to a conference, I'm there from the morning until the night. I'm there every day that I'm there. Um, and I really try to get as much out of it as I can. I try to be a good steward of the university's funding. Um, but this one was different. I wasn't presenting. And I just went to soak up as much as I could. Um, and so the, the only drawback to that was at those conferences, I ended up picking up three or four or five more texts that I realized I hadn't read that I should have read. As I'm listening to these speakers, I'm like, oh, I haven't read that one. And then I'm, you know, in the exhibit hall buying all these texts, and, and that's how it's, you know, extended to 22 texts. Um, anyway, and then I developed a course on brain-based learning and uh, in the digital age. So, you know, educational theory's been around for a long time, but the real hard science of education really didn't start happening until about 30 years ago. Um, and that's when real research was done on how learning happens and what makes learning happen in a classroom. But the sci brain science really didn't come into it, I don't want to say come into its own, but substantial changes in cognitive science have happened because of the use of imaging. And instead of having to you know, experiment on a brain while somebody's under surgery and see what works and doesn't work and find out afterwards that these are the most effective way of treating certain things. 
um, we can actually scan the brain and see what's going on in the brain when people are thinking or talking or acting or learning. And so brain scans have just completely changed the way we look at what the brain does when it learns. And, um, and so this has really informed educational theory in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, it's confirmed educational theory, and in other ways, it's debunked myths and other educational theories. Um, and of course, neuroplasticity is one of the you know, big findings in the last two decades regarding brain science, and that is that we used to think the brain was finite, or um, whatever you were born with is what you have. Um, you have a certain number of limited uh, neurons, uh, three, uh, three billion, I believe it is. Um, maybe, no, maybe it's 300 billion. Anyways, just an astronomical number. Um, but, uh, and by the way, I'm not a biologist. I don't, I, I didn't study to be a biologist. I didn't, my sabbatical wasn't about biology, but I wanted to see that intersection of and, and, and how learning happens. Um, but anyway, so we find out in the last two decades that the brain changes, that the brain can continue to grow, um, that it's not finite. Um, or predetermined or, or whatever. Um, and so this notion of neuroplasticity is that our brains are, um, it, it's not plastic the way we think of it, like these chairs. The original, uh, the origin of the word plastic actually means malleable, movable, uh, changeable. Um, so that, that's this concept of neuroplasticity. And a fascinating study was done on London taxi cab drivers that actually confirmed uh, this, uh, well, it's not a theory, this fact of neuro, neuroplasticity. So London tax, taxi cab drivers have to memorize 25,000 streets and landmarks. And they have to pass a test in order to become a taxi cab driver. And so I'm not sure who came up with this idea, but they decided to study the brains of London taxi cab drivers to find out if they were different. And so they looked at um, a, a large group of people who were going to be studying to be a London taxi cab driver. And they broke into three groups, essentially. One was the group that never made it past the very beginning. One group was they made it to the end, but they didn't pass the exam. And one group was the, the people who passed the exam and became taxi cab drivers. And the brains of London taxi cab drivers are substantially different than the other two groups, the ones who succeeded their uh, hippocampi are actually uh, thicker um, and bigger. Um, and when they looked at them, uh, when they were imaging them, they could see the thickness of certain neural pathways. Uh, it was just a fascinating study, but it was an, a, a, just a, a wonderful confirmation about how the brain is different and how it changes. So when, um, when I was studying brain-based learning, I, I came across a number of principles um, in, in different texts. And one, of course, is that the brain is wired to search for meaning. And we really know that. We're, we're born to, to learn. You watch a two-year-old, and, and, and they're just constantly learning. Um, and, but what that means is if we can tap into that as instructors, um, that desire to learn, to make sense out of it, to make it personally relevant. We're going to make learning happen more effectively for our students. Um, we also know that the big picture can't be separated from the details, although we often only teach the details. We don't always come back, circle back around to the big picture and help them hang those details onto the big picture. Um, we know that people learn best from solving real world problems. Um, so when we get them engaged in problem based learning, we know it's going to stick. Um, emotions play a really important part in memory. And you know this because your most memorable things in your life are the things that are tied to some emotional event, either positive or negative. Um, and, and we often think that there's no place in the classroom for emotions, but if you're not tapping into the emotions of your students, then you're missing out on a really powerful way to help them learn something. Um, but emotions can also block learning. And we'll look at that in just a minute like now. Um, so the amygdala, um, which is named after um, an organ that's, uh, well, it has two parts and they're shaped like almonds and that's the, um, the etymology of the word amygdala, Latin etymology. Um, it serves as a switching station so uh, for the brain. So if you're experiencing something really negative that causes you to go into a fight or flight, the amygdala sends the stuff the, that information that you're taking in to another part of the brain that helps you to survive, the fight or flight part. 
Um, so it, it, information won't get through to the prefrontal cortex where you do all of your rational thinking um, if you're in survival mode. Um, so if your students feel threatened in your class, if they feel devalued in your class, if they're feeling a whole other emotions that are causing them to go into survival mode to, uh, to protect their own identity, to protect their own self-image, um, they're not going to be learning your stuff. So fear is not a very good motivator in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> so some more principles of brain-based learning. Learning is active and social. We learn better, we fire more in our brains, there are more synapses going on when we're involved in a social environment um, and when we're active. Um, memory is not stored in one location. And this is really important because if we can tap into multiple mo modalities when we're teaching our students, then they're going to remember something better because it will draw from different parts of the brain. So if it's drawing from uh, the parts that manage visual and sight and smell and emotions, the more parts that are firing in the brain, the, the stronger the memory is going to be. Um, so it's, that was a, a very important finding, and they found that also through imaging. When they saw how a, the brain was activated with certain things, there were more um, again, more synapses, more firing with the more um, uh, senses uh, that were engaged. Um, and feedback, we usually think of feedback as what we give students at the end. We score the exam, we score the paper, we, you know, we give them feedback at the end. Um, but remember, summative and formative feedback are two very different things. Summative is what you get at the end, formative is what you get to help form the student, to help change the student, to help the student grow. And if you think about it, summative format, summative feedback is to formative feedback as an autopsy is to a physical. An autopsy, you're not really giving information to help make any changes, you're just giving the information about how it all sized up. But formative feedback is going to help somebody change, just like a physical. You get really useful information, you put that information into work. Uh, so feedback is a tool for learning, not just assessing. So what happens when neural pathways are established? And if you think about that little walkway there as a neural pathway, you can see the more times it's walked, the easier it is to walk. Um, so the more connections, the stronger or thicker the neural pathway becomes. Repetition in, increases those, uh, that pathway, it strengthens those connections. The more we use an idea, a skill, or a process, the smoother and the faster and the more accurate we get at it. And just remember those phrases, uh, neurons that fire together are wired together, and um, you, you use it or you lose it. Um, and then individual neurons aren't what make us smart, it's those connections that make us smart. So if we think about memory, oh, you might want to read that quote, I love that quote from Eskils. And memory is really important for us, right? Not just as academics, but it's important if we want our students to really genuinely learn something. Um, so, fact or myth? If you expose yourself to something enough times, you'll burn it into your memory. Fact or myth? It's a myth. I'm going to prove it to you. What's a penny look like? Think right now in your mind what a penny looks like. Okay, look at the front. Think about the front of the penny. What's on the front? Who's on the front? What's he wearing? What words are on? What words are on the front of a penny? Okay, maybe. What's on the back of the penny? Okay, there's a building. Anybody know what building? What words are on the back of a penny? Yes. How many times have you looked at a penny? Really? How many times have you looked at a penny? Now, what I would normally do is have you draw the penny and see how many of you could actually draw it and take a look at how accurate we are. See? Someone said, in God we trust on the front. E pluribus unit on the back. Did you remember of the United States on the top with a one cent? Okay, you had it facing the wrong way, okay? All right, so you look at a penny thousands, if not tens of thousands of times, maybe millions, I don't know. Um, but you couldn't remember that. 
Did you learn it? We'll circle back around to that. So when we think about learning in our classrooms, we think, okay, information gets encoded. Okay, we're lecturing, we're giving information, we're delivering the content, right? And we hope that goes into storage for our students. Um, and then they retrieve it for the exam. But that retrieval area is a really important learning area. They should be retrieving it often because remember the neural pathways get better established when they retrieve it often. What are we doing in our classrooms to, to have our students retrieve information before they come to our exam? How are we orchestrating our learning activities so students are retrieving it, circling back around and using it? Because long-term memory, and I think that's what we want, not just memory for the exam next Monday, but I mean, whatever day you're getting an exam, um, but we want our students to really remember this stuff because we want them to do really well in their professions. So long-term memory is dependent on those neural pathways being established. Um, so retrieval is a critical step in developing long-term memories. And we'll talk about retrieval practice now. Um, so retrieval requires students to pull the information out. Every time they pull it out, this pathway gets stronger. It, it improves that long-term memory. Um, so what we should be including low stakes retrieval practice in our classrooms, whether that's quizzes that don't even count, maybe it's quizzes that do count, um, maybe it's um, exit tickets, maybe it's a quick three to one at the end of class, three things you learn, two things, two ways you can apply it to your work, one question you have about it, um, but just some ways of retrieving what they're learning. Um, it's best, interestingly enough, when it's included as a part of what, um, what um, Brown, Rodiger, and Daniel call desirable difficulty. We want them to struggle a little bit with it. We want them to work hard at it. It's just like when you're at the gym. If you're lifting five pound weights and you really should be lifting 15, you're really not getting much out of it. But we want them to work. Um, so also spacing retrieval, not just retrieving for five hours the night before the exam. But spacing retrieval over time increases memory. How many times do we teach something and never come back around to it? Is our goal just for our students to do okay on the exam or do well on the exam, or is our goal really long-term memory for our students? That's our job. Provide feedback to reinforce knowledge and correct misunderstandings. I talked about that. And then um, our students don't know a lot of this. They don't realize what retrieval is because it's hard work. Okay, another quick myth or fact. Rereading notes and text is an effective study strategy. Rereading and rereading and rereading. Depends. Depends? It's like the penny. Exactly. It's just like the penny. It's a myth. And I love this quote. Rereading creates the illusion of mastery. Words and phrases become familiar, just like the penny, leading students to believe they know the material. But I bet you a lot of the students in your classroom this is their primary study strategy. They get their notes out and they read them and they reread them and they reread them. And they're the ones that are sitting there in your class going, I know this. But they don't. And that's the reason they can't answer the questions. Because they thought they knew it because they read it and they reread it and they reread it. And they thought they knew it, but they never retrieved it. They were always putting it in and not taking it back out. Forgetting is important. I used to feel really badly when I forget things. I would think, oh, I have a terrible memory. Well, now I, I feel really good about it because memory is really important. Because, yeah. So I just tell myself this when I can't remember things. Oh, yeah, that's okay. I had to let that one go. Um, you literally have to make room for other memories. So forgetting is a natural process. Your body's made that way. Your brain is made that way. If you think about the number of interactions and things you have seen in the last 24 hours, if your brain tried to hold on to all of those, you would go crazy. What color were you wearing yesterday? What color was your spouse or your partner wearing yesterday? What shoes was he or she wearing? What, uh, what, did, what did he have for breakfast or she have for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? What did you wear three days ago? All of those things are part of your everyday life. How many people did you pass today? walking by and you never thought about it, but you saw them, your brain can't remember all that. It doesn't need to remember all that. So it's made to let go of the things that don't matter. Most forgetting occurs shortly after the learning. You're gone. 
Um, but what that also means is throughout the day, your students are learning, losing more and more of what they learn. So if your students aren't really looking at that stuff that they learned and thinking about that and retrieving it until the exam, and you, they learned that stuff or were exposed to that stuff three, six weeks ago, they may as well just be reteaching themselves. Uh, students must recall and rehearse it, um, the information periodically if it's to be consolidated into long-term memory. So how, how can we help our students create memories, truly create memories, not just exposure to content? Um, active, um, uh, you want to activate more networks, more neural networks, more ways that they're taking in information. Um, and that gives them greater accessibility to that information, again, because they're widening those neural pathways. Engage their emotions. Use rhyme and song. How many of you used, learned your ABCs with the ABC song? How many of you watch Schoolhouse Rock and you can't ever forget conjunction, function, whatever it is? Conjunction, junction, that's my function. Okay, that was all music. That's another area of your brain that you're activating. And um, so music is a good way. Um, you know, of course, using repetitions, creating associations, making connections to our personal lives. If you can make that content relevant or help them activate connections to their personal lives, it's going to be easier to retrieve. Telling stories. We think storytelling is, is, is a waste of time, but it is a very concrete way of making um, memories. Um, and then, of course, drawing is another way of activating more neural pathways. Uh, pathways. Um, okay. Um, working memory. It's not the same, although you'll see it in a lot of books, as short-term memory. Working memory is really short. Short-term memory is short, but it's not as short as working memory. Um, it, think of it as your workbench. It's kind of when information is coming in, it's where you have to decide what to do with it. You used to think that uh, working memory could hold three to seven um, items, but recent research indicates that really a working memory can only hold one to three. And yet we are piling on information after information without giving students a chance to process it, to, uh, to do something with it, to consolidate it in their memories. Um, it's also time sensitive. It doesn't last very long. Um, but we often overload them too much, too fast. They won't last. Um, and then how can we kind of deal with that? Because we have a lot of information to give our students. We can't just give them two pieces or three pieces of information in a 10 minute period. Um, so how do we deal with that? We help them with chunking. So who thinks they can remember that? Study it for about three, three to five seconds. See if you can remember that in a minute. Anybody? Doris? 9021. 177-196. Close, very close. Okay. Would that make it a little bit easier to remember? I suspect more of you could probably remember that if we did that same task. How about this one? I bet everybody could because it has meaning. All of them have meaning. We know 2019 is now, 1776 is when our, with our Declaration of Independence, 911. You could remember those in 10 minutes. So we've chunked that information. Chunking, oh, how about this word or these letters? Can you remember those letters? Can you remember those? Same letters. But these letters have meaning attached to them. They're chunked to, get, to be one piece of information. So chunking is when the working memory perceives a set of uh, data or information as a single item. And we can help our students chunk. An effective way of enlarging the memory's capacity um, is by making these associations or establishing meaning, and we can help our students by teaching them to chunk. I love um, cognitive, uh, well, Joseph Sweller, or John Sweller, um, really did a lot of writing on this notion of cognitive load theory. Um, and he really did it in the, in the perspective of you can overload a class with too much information, you can overload a, a learning management system with too many bells and whistles. Uh, we think it's all cute or it has lots of music or it has lots of colors and variations and fonts, but that's actually, that can cause cognitive overload. So the definition of it is um, it's the amount of mental effort and information that the working memory can handle at one time. In order to reduce it, um, we, and, um, in, 
excuse me, reducing cognitive overload in order to increase information processing and retention. So that's our goal is to really be able to help our students focus. Um, again, too much, too fast, it won't last. Distracting sensory input is just that, it's distracting, so limit it. And avoid divided attention. The brain cannot multitask. That actually uh, has been recently proven. There's a lot of, about that. Uh, uh, John Medina, who wrote Brain Rules, is really big on, on talking about how we, the brain really cannot multitask. It's kind of funny because we pride ourselves in our ability to multitask. The truth of the matter is you're just shifting from one task to the next, back and forth, back and forth. And when you're doing that, you're actually really inefficient. Um, so you really can't multitask. That's cognitive science. Okay, I love this little um, example of cognitive load. Let's see if it works. It's not going to work. It's working here, but it's not working there. You can just imagine what's going on right now. <laughs> okay, so if you pour Coke into a glass, and you just pour it all in at one time, and it's fast and it's furious, what happens? It all just comes back out, right? It overflows. But if you pour a little and stop, and you pour a little and you stop, and you pour a little and you stop, and you get it all in there. And that's really cognitive load theory in a video. Oh, great. I just derailed it. Okay, so how can we help our students maintain their memories? Um, you let them know you have to work to make a memory and to maintain that memory. Lose it or use it, or excuse me, use it or lose it. Uh, the more a memory trace or prior neural pathway is activated, the more marked it'll become. Retrieval and rehearsal practice, as I said, and students need to use a retrieve info uh, soon after encountering for it to become encoded into long-term memory. So some strategies to, to boost long-term memory, um, formative assessments, as I mentioned, they help form students, they help them to grow intellectually, uh, spacing, not studying all at once, no one done, um, interleaving is, uh, we haven't talked about that, but that's not just spacing, that's actually mixing up things, so they're not just focused on one simple thing at a time. That desirable difficulty, that switching gears a little bit and coming back, that actually there's evidence to show that interleaving practice can be a very effective way of establishing stronger memories. Helping our students understand that self-testing, even though it's a little harder and takes more energy, is more effective than just reading the notes. Uh, Pre-testing is one thing we can do to activate prior knowledge, to get them engaged in the content, to give them something to hang this new information on. Um, and then again, over time, the connections between the neurons that are activated more often will be strengthened, while those that are not will be weakened and lost. So a few other strategies to boost memory. Summarization of text, content uh, to be learned. So uh, letting your students know that, again, note taking isn't, or note review isn't the most effective way, but you can help them with these, this summarization. Again, with exit slips, with the three, two, one, with different ways of uh, summarizing what they just learned. And you can do this periodically with quick writes throughout a class period. Um, elaborative interrogation is when students have to explain concepts. Um, talking is a great strategy in class to get students um, thinking about um, their content and mastering their content. Mnemonics and then uh, imagery is also. Uh, I'm kind of trying to slide through these because I don't want to be on time. So I, I, I don't have time today to talk about all the technology tools that I explore that support brain-based learning. Different ways of activating the brain, ways of activating the social brain, tools to use for using a formative assessment, uh, using multimodalities, and uh, also virtual and augmented realities. Um, all of those um, are, tie into how we know the brain learns. I'm happy to share these slides with you, to share these tools with you, to talk about any of those tools that you could use in your classroom um, to, uh, to make the most of how we know the brain learns. So final thoughts. 
I mentioned at the beginning, literally, that my sabbatical was just the time of my life. I don't know why I waited 14 years to do it, and I don't recommend that anybody do that. Um, it truly is. You know, I, I just kind of thought it was a nice gift. You know, I work hard, though, you know, they give you a semester to go do whatever scholarship you want to do. It truly is a renewing time in the life of an academic. Um, and it's really important that you start planning it literally years before you take your sabbatical. All those things that you've been thinking about and whining about, and I'm doing that too, that you don't have time to do. I wish I could do this. I wish I could pursue this study. I really want to know more about this or, uh, or whatever. Those are things you should be putting in your sabbatical file right now. Because when it comes to the year before your sabbatical, when you're doing your application for sabbatical, you want to have a lot to go over. You may already have that sabbatical project planned out. Um, because you knew these were things that, you know, or, or you may have more things to draw from, to think about. Do I want to do this or do I want to do that? Um, but I, I just, I, I, it can be so productive if you really are gearing it toward what you love, what you're passionate about, what you've been wanting to pursue, then the time just literally flies. Well, your sabbatical time will fly whether you're doing anything important or not. <laughs> But it really will when you're having the time of your life. Um, so there's stuff in the contract. I don't know where it'll be in the new contract or when that'll come out, but there will be stuff I imagine in the contract that will tell you when you can apply and so forth. But it's a year ahead of time, so you don't want to miss your deadline. Um, you can do uh, a, a, a one semester uh, for a full pay or uh, a full year uh, for half pay. And some people do that. They find other academic work to get paid for during the time, so they couldn't even do a full year. I, I, I didn't do that. I just did a semester. Um, and you do have to provide clear and measurable goals. You have to say, this is what I plan to do, um, and these are my deliverables. Um, but um, it, it really is. It is a gift, but it's so much more than that. Um, and I, I encourage you um, to take the gift and run with it and just have the time to run. Uh, we're going to have a, a reception afterwards, and that'll give you an opportunity to talk to our presenters. Uh, for the sake of time, keep us on schedule. I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our next pre presenter to us. This is Marcella Van Olfen, uh, whose sabbatical project was the Balancing Act of Teaching and Research, a Synergistic Result. Thank you. Thank you for being here, all of you, and for the support, most of all. And um, as Candy said, when I knew I could take a sabbatical, I missed the, the deadline one semester. I was too busy and said, oh, I don't have the proposal, I haven't done it. And I said, the next one, I am not missing it. So I had time uh, to think about it and um, conceptualize the project. So when conceptualizing the project, I had to think about what I was going to do, how I was going to do it, what were my guiding principles, and I had to make some decisions and find something that brought balance to what I wanted to do. And to me, the balance was between teaching and research and thinking, OK, whatever I do, it has to uh, affect my teaching. It has to affect my scholarship. And most of all, the, you know, the end product has to uh, make an impact on the student's life. So I had to find my balance. And I don't know why the pictures are not coming, but I had pictures of over here, and I said, give me a second. Hmm. And um, finding the balance, and, and to me, it wasn't when I was talking about finding the balance, it was finding the balance not just within, but among all the pieces that they were involved in the project. And so that's how I end up having um, two goals and a project. And uh, the two goals were well, goal number one was to conduct research on a project that a uh, while ago my, one of my colleagues and I had been talking about. And Spanish classes are known because they draw females. And so we have always few males that some of them come, not because they want to learn Spanish sometimes. And she teaches at the yeah, oh yeah. 
And she teaches at the Naval Academy in Minneapolis, which she has all the other cases around. So if we wanted to do a study in gender, we were the perfect partners in crime because I have the female, she has the males. And um, so that, that was the plan, working together and collecting data uh, during the fall of my sabbatical. But in Spanish we say, el hombre propone y Dios dispone. That means, you know, men propose and God decides. So, God had something else in his plan for me. And when we hire someone to take care of my classes, but uh, that person, two days before classes began, uh, told us that he got a full-time job somewhere else. So, uh, Liz and I were like, who is Liz? I saw Liz earlier. Liz and I were like, okay, what do we do now? So we started calling people that we had in the roster. And someone came and said, yes, I can start. And so we interviewed, and Chantel was here already. So we interviewed the person. The person was coming on Tuesday. I was meeting the person on Tuesday uh, at the security office. But about 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. of Tuesday, Liz got an email saying that she wasn't doing it. So I said, OK, don't worry, Liz. I think over. I'll, I'll teach until we find someone. So I started teaching. <laughs> and, and then we interviewed a couple more. But uh, no suitable candidate was available. And so we, unfortunately, we had to cancel classes. So part of my goal one that was collect data was gone. So that's when you, you know, resiliency and creativity and good friends all come in place. So I call Sylvia and I say, and, and I was concerned because Sylvia was going up for full professor and she needed this. She needed to pick her CV. And I say, Sylvia. Okay, this is a problem, but here is a solution, I think. Let me see if you if you like it. So I say, okay, you know what? Let's do let's focus on writing a paper for practitioners. Because after all, what we are trying to impact this teaching. So the um, important thing to know with research in foreign languages is that the leading field is ESL. So there are more learnings of English than languages in, in you know like Spanish, French, Italian. So most of the research is usually done in ESL. And that's why when we study applied linguistics, we take the route of ESL, because if we have that foundation, then we can apply it to different languages. So all the research that is done in reading strategies and preferences, and gender preferences, is done in English. So there is nothing done in Spanish. So that was our alley. So it's OK, listen, you know, we know enough of strategies. We know enough of what works. And we can write a paper that is going to be for the language educator children, that is a magazine for practitioners that the American Council on Teaching Foreign Languages published. They have a peer referee section that is a focus topic, and I said, that's our plan. Do you think it will fly for you? And she's like, yes, wonderful plan, so let's do it. So, start moving on that one. Goal number two, develop a new course for the minor in Spanish that introduces students to Spanish cultural wealth and diversity, with emphasis on understanding the influence of Al Andalus as part of Spain history. So you may think, OK, a new course? Yes, for the minor, we have one course, uh, two electives. One focuses in Spain, general course. The other one focuses on Latin America. And why this course? Well, a few years ago, not so long ago, I was teaching uh, one of the courses, the, the one that specializes in Spain, and one of the students looked at me and said, so prehistory happened in Spain. And I thought that maybe the grammar in Spanish wasn't good and I haven't understood what she was trying to say. And I said, tell, tell, me, tell me more about your question. What do you mean by that? And she was like, so we were talking about uh, Alameda caves that they are, you know, prehistory and tropestrian paints. And she says, yes, so there was prehistory in Spain. And I say, yes, there was prehistory in Spain. And she wasn't the only one that was looking at me like, you know, kind of like, really? And I say, yes, the sense of my sense of humor, and I, I was kidding, seriously, thinking that they were, you know, kind of teasing me. I say, what, do you think that you know, Spain pop up in the 1400s with Isabel and Ferdinand, you know, conquering Granada and the last, you know, stronghold of the Moors. 
And they looked at me, and it looked like that was the thought they had. And they said, well, no, why? There's more history than that, you know? <laughs> so at that moment, I started thinking, I said, oh, maybe I should do something like that. So that, that's how I got the inspiration to do uh, the second goal. So, oops, what happened here? There's a problem. Do you think they... Something happened with the PowerPoint when we... Yeah. No. Um, let me see. I have another another memory stick. I plan another one. But in the meantime, let me tell you something. Now, going into gender preferences and reading comprehension strategies, we know by research that the best language learners are the ones that they know and they find a way strategizing their learning. And this is overall. And we also know that the more language strategies they use, the faster they will learn. But we also know that when it comes to gender, that females are more strategic than males. And that there are different types of learning strategies that we use. And these strategies are divided. There are different models, but the ones that we refer the most to um, reading are one, one set of strategies is about Top, uh, can we process reading? And they are top down and bottom up. One set focuses more on details and the other on the big picture. The big picture set of strategies seems to be the most preferred by females. And when we say that set of strategies, we think the big picture is bottom, it's top down. While males prefer uh, the Sorry, the vice versa. And what that brings forward is thinking and reflection about how we, how we present reading exercises in our classes. When we think about reading, reading is clinical for everyone. It doesn't matter where you are. If you cannot read or you don't read well, you're not going to go farther. Can you imagine in a second language when reading is tied to language acquisition, vocabulary development, so you cannot go further if your reading is not good. So, in this case, what happens is that if you have a class like mine, that I have mostly females and few males, I want to help them and I want to raise awareness about what are the things that may work better for them. So, in my case, it's about guiding them and say, okay, here are strategies, try these strategies, and try this other set of strategies. So they can experiment with different types of approaches to reading. And if you think about reading in the, in the second language, it's more complex than reading in the first language, because you have a text that is going to be full of subtext and cultural notes that they may not understand. They may understand the meaning, but they may not know what's behind that. It doesn't make sense to them. So it's, it becomes very important that when you have classes like the ones I have or Syria, we are aware and we train the students. So helping the students to develop basic reading is super important. And how we do that? By presenting the different types of strategies they can use. And when we do so, we don't tell them, okay, these strategies will work for, you know, females, these strategies work well for males. We should say, here are the strategies, you try them, and then you tell me. So when we were um, writing the paper, the paper uh, was submitted in December and hopefully got accepted in February, pending revisions, so we sent the revisions, and it should appear published in May. Uh, when we send the, when, when we were conceptualizing and writing the paper, and since this is for teachers, we made sure that we put some uh, strategies for teaching. Like, okay, you can make a chart, you can have your students select strategies, and you can keep track. When we were doing all this, uh, Sylvia and I also developed a couple of reading workshops to give to our students. And I started with the first part, so next uh, semester, hopefully, some of them will come back and we will finish with that uh, reading training. But most of all, 
it's about when we think about reading strategies and gender preferences in second language, it's about presenting them with the choices and making sure that they can pick among different strategies. So uh, one of the tools we have is a, a table where students can take home and fill in and then as a teacher, we don't define gender, we just the gender columns, we leave them open and we say, you know, you self-identify and then we collect the data. So uh, this semester, since I have classes and I will be approved, I collect the data and hopefully during the summer we will analyze it. So it was, you know, a blessing in disguise because Otherwise, we wouldn't have written the other paper that we wrote. So now we have the data from this paper, from, you know, we're collecting now. So we have hopefully a paper from this data, data set. Okay. So now, since we have maybe a problem with the picture, let's go to this one. So the new, um, the go to develop a new course, Al Andalus. You may be thinking, why Al Andalus? Well, I told you a little bit before. As it turns out, the peoples of Al Andalus were in Spain, or today we know as Spain, for 800 years. So if you have a civilization that is in a place for 800 years, for sure they leave, you know, a mark on it. And um, people did usually, the other thing is uh, with the students and, you know, the general public, when you say Al Andalus, everyone thinks Andalusia, flamenco. Al-Andalus was more than that. It was a state that was formed at the beginning of the 700s. And how did it happen? Who, you know, who were the people? Well, you know, there were the Visigoths in Spain, and the Visigoths, what happened, they were, had civil wars. So they needed mercenaries. What did they do? They called people from Northern Africa to be the mercenaries. People from Northern Africa came to Spain, they liked what they saw, they stayed. You know, so when they stay, you know, it's like, be careful what you wish here, because they stay, but not only that they stay, that then more people came, and then they invade and they conquer. So, okay. and um, when we think about how long they stay, we say 800 years. In 800 years, many things happened, and many contributions happened. And why the contributions? Oh, oops, sorry. What kind of contributions? All the pictures are gone. I have pictures from medicine, uh, from the Museum of uh, Al Andalus in the Calahorra Tower in Cordoba, and uh, all the surgery instruments. They used to practice cataract surgery. Can you imagine? In the 800s, 900s. And uh, that I have a lot of pictures from when I have students from biology, and they have to do their project. I say, okay, you know, here you have some medicine stuff for you. And they also, uh, another contribution, big contribution they did was uh, anything that was irrigation. The land was dry, but they took advantage of what there was there from the Romans. And they continued the water channels, so they began irrigating, and when they began irrigating, you have new crops. So they introduced lots of um, fruits and vegetables that they were not there like citrus, okay. So uh, that generates another big contribution that is the gastronomy. So there's all the foods, like when you go to Seville or Cordoba or Granada and you eat gazpacho, that is a cold soup made of tomatoes, that's a heritage, okay. And also uh, the other contribution, as most of you know it, with astronomy. Astronomy and predicting the weather, looking at how the different equinoxes work and what was best for the harvest. Okay, so how do we plan to put all that together? Well, I put it together in this way. So this team planning, it's Al-Andalus. One thing is that when I was conceptualizing the course for the minor, I remember that Alexia, one of my first students, in the, the first student actually that finished the minor would invite her roommates to come to class. Her roommates didn't speak in Spanish. So Alexia was translating for her, for them. 
because this when uh, this was a group, the Altamira group, and uh, they, they say, oh really, that all that happened? And they say, yeah, sure, invite your friends. I don't mind. Just if you translate, do it in a way that is not disruptive for the other ones. And so the couple of students that didn't speak Spanish start coming. And so this is very interesting. So at that time, I started thinking, I said, we should have an English version of it. So now, as I was developing this, and I said, why not? I am doing this. I do one. I do another one. So the second course I developed is a Spanish to International Perspectives in Translation, Peoples of Al-Andalus. And that one I submitted to the um, UAE University of Relations uh, Committee for the Human Adventure category. So the theme runs for both of them. It's uh, Al-Andalus and the contributions, the people and the contributions. And the organizing principles for each of them is a little bit different because um, for the human adventure, the course is ruled or guided by the principles of the National Council on Social Science, Social Studies, NASA, the Association of International Educators, while for Spanish, the other one is more hardcore language, linguistic, cultural course. So they will be learning about Al-Andalus, but from different perspectives. And uh, the focus for the um, uh, UE course is to internationalize the curriculum, and the focus for uh, the minor is to expand the electives offering, because now they have just two, so this one will be the third one, and they can choose. Since we don't have that many students um, in Spanish for the Spanish minor, usually you know that the groups are rather small, and uh, we talk a lot with the students and we make decisions about what course you want to take next. Because if they are electives, and they say, oh, we're intrigued by this one, and I say, okay, which of the electives do you want to do? And they tell me, and so we want to do this one, I say, okay, we'll offer that one. So early in the semester, before we have to submit the schedule, I do the survey, and then uh, for the next rotation, it's one or the other one. So basically, it's like this is the student's uh, choice. And then in terms of uh, connections, what types of connections uh, these courses uh, I aim to make? For the UE students, about giving them the opportunity to uh, explore different uh, measures, different topics. Uh, at that time, they don't know if they want to go, you know, history or biology some, in some cases. So hopefully the project will open those doors and if they are more interested in one field than another one, the projects all can be adapted to the area they want to study. Uh, for, the major, for the minor, uh, they, usually the projects, what they do is, like if I have students from marketing, they focus that on marketing. Students in tourism, they end up developing something for, you know, to apply in an internship or to have ready for their portfolio. And the bio students are always the ones that they are uh, very interesting because they look into the medicine advances that have happened or who are the Nobel Prizes, what they have done, and they usually write a paper about the biotopic in Spanish. And in one occasion, I had one student that presented the paper in, in Mexico in a conference. So it was very good. And some sample class, class assignments, uh, we have Instagram posts uh, and an alternative assignment. If they don't want to do in Instagram because they are not in social media, they can do a PowerPoint. And the post, but we have the, you know, the post, the captions for the post, it will be like the notes of the PowerPoint that they can do in the form of a paper or in the form of the notes. And uh, they can do history tours, virtual field trips, and uh, they may choose to participate in a field trip, in a real field trip to Spain. And the students that they choose to do so, we will uh, tweak a little bit the assignments so they fit the, you know, the, 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 the field trip. And while they are on the field trip, that is not the tour. They are not just, you know, hanging out and doing nothing. They are supposed to be doing a lot. So, and uh, the other question, uh, you know, you may have, or you may be wondering, it's like, okay, one is the same thing, one is 200, the other one 300. The level of the assignments will be different. Although, you know, they may choose the two different groups do the same, like a field trip or a tour, a history tour, the, the level of research and the expectation is different. 
let's see. And about the field trip, not that I have any more pictures. <laughs> and um, about the field trip, the, the idea of the field trip is uh, I haven't have finalized anything, but uh, there are like uh, two or three different uh, companies that um, they can do it. I would do it myself with them, but it's too much of a risk because of the reservations. But basically, it will be to go and to visit three landmarks uh, that they are uh, Cordoba, Seville, and uh, Granada. Uh, Seville is, offers one of the best examples of syncretism among the cultures and among the different uh, heritage and legacies you can see there. And uh, if you take a look at, at the um, at La Giralda, La Giralda used to be uh, first the minaret of a mosque, and then it became part of the cathedral, the Catholic cathedral. And in the 1300s, there was, a, there was a, an earthquake, quake. and so the, the, the upper part uh, was destroyed, and they made um, the bells, there. they put the bells for the Catholic Church. So, but in the very, in the very foundation, there are Roman constructions. So uh, that is an emblematic building for the students because they see all the, the, the Romans, the Catholics, and the Muslim uh, influence. And uh, another, um, another uh, part of the trip that goes to Cordoba, Cordoba is uh, another example of uh, influence uh, under, uh, from the people of Al Andalus because Cordoba was the most prosperous city in the Middle Ages. And it was the capital of the caliphate when I told the students and I said, there was a califato, había un califato in Cordoba. They look at me and they say, no, califatos are from other parts of the world. And they say, no, there was one there. And we are missing the map too. And um, so the, the caliphate of Cordoba, Cordoba city, was the most, it was called the pearl of uh, the Occident. So that's the reason why of you know, choosing that city. And finally, Granada. Granada is called as the last strong uh, hall of the Moors. And it was a city, there is a very um, a, a complex that is called La, La Hamra complex that um, it's very emblematic or, and, and the symbolism that carries because from uh, one of the, the places in La Alhambra that is called the door of the seven it's a puerta de los siete suelos, meaning the door of the seven floors, because there are seven floors, was uh, where the last sultan exit to leave and to surrender the city and give entrance to the Catholic uh, queen and king. So that's another place for the students uh, to go. And that they can spend the whole day there. And um, since it, Every, every new monarch that came at the building, you have places that they were built in the 600, 700, 800, 900, until the palace of uh, Carlos V, that was emperor, and it's like a more modern, and it really, it sticks out in that complex, that palace. So for the students, it's like so much history in one place. And they realize that the Spain didn't pop up in the 1400s. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you have any more questions. There is one more that says uh, question mark. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions about any of the projects. What we could do at this point is go and have a, a little reception and, and have uh, an opportunity to talk to Marcella and, and Candace folks. Um, again, you know, we have people out at the centers who uh, coming in, so I'm sure if you have any questions for uh, Marcella and Candice, we could certainly um, be happy to have either one of them will take an email from you so they can talk to, to those who are at the centers listening right now. But I think at this point, Marcella, I, I say gracias, and the same to Candice, and to all of you who came today, and of course to Carolyn and the live for setting everything up uh, uh, for us. We've got some nice refreshments for you, so I hope you take some time Talk, have some conversations about uh, their sabbatical and their work. Um, that was fascinating for all of us. Thank you so much for coming. Okay.
Thank you. Okay, good.